So welcome along. This is the Escapade Show, episode twenty-one. Twenty-one. Wow. Twenty-one. Twenty-one. My age. Aye, and we've got a legend of the Scottish dance music scene. In Huge. Fact, the dance music scene in general. David Forbes is sitting here with us today. Thanks for having us, guys. Thank you. What's happening, Davey? How I, are we? I'm good, mate. I'm good. It's been a long time coming, eh? It has been. We've uh, we've been. How long we've been trying to make this happen? Two years or something. Ah, yeah. Probably. Yeah. Uh, two years, I'd say. Yeah. Um, to be fair, the last time we were supposed to do it, there was a. I don't know what there was. There was a crash or something. Like there that, was. So. And you just sent a picture. With like cars piled up. Well, it one motor. <laughs> oh, look, there's a motor on the road. I better not come down. <laughs> it's the same motor, just photoshopped. <laughs> just sat in your bed, I mean. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. So it's not. It's been. It's not been a lack of trying anyway. We've uh, we've all just been tremendously yeah. busy, as you yeah, know. Um, so how are you anyway? All good? Yeah, very well. You know, just usual dealing um, with dad life. Mm-hmm. The old gig here and there, and making a noise in the studio as always. Balancing this crazy lifestyle of being full time in the music industry. Yeah, oh well, yeah, yeah. That's that's a hard one, isn't it? Sometimes <laughs> you, you can have it any other, other way though. No, no. There is days when you're getting that. Fuck, I'm not. It. I'm gonna go and get a real job. Mm-hmm. Then you're back in the studio the next day. <laughs> like, no, I'm not <laughs> cranking it up, <laughs> loving it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, so how's the studio going just now then? Uh, uh, do you know what? It's it's just I mean it's it's the same as always. I think mm. I think just to be just to be able to get up in the morning and go and do something you lo- you love is you know you know people talk about success. I think that's success in Absolutely. a nutshell, isn't it? You know, getting up and doing right. Wow, well, I'm going to the studio. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go and make a noise in the studio. I'm going to mm-hmm. go make music, mm-hmm. and and be fortunate enough to. To do that, I had to do that and pay your bills. You know, it's just I think such a good outlook. Like that really is like to stay humble at that and really to how 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 much to appreciate something like that when you think about it. I mean, some day I mean you do some days you just take it for granted what you actually you know yourself you know you know you take for granted just because you've been doing it for so long. I'm sure. Again, from a football analogy, you know. He loves an analogy, by the way. He's great. Footballers get up, you know, they go and kick a ball. Yeah, for their full career and you know and um, you know they do take it for granted sometimes you just need to pinch yourself and give it oh, wait a minute I'm fucking doing something I love here mm. you know you know. so I think you just need to be humble I think you need to just be grateful mm-hmm. I know it. and it's, it's being grateful I guess that brings opportunities and allows it to keep going on mm-hmm. and on and on and on you know and you can keep I guess with that mindset you know that you're you're not letting the ego kick in, like I'm doing this full time and blah blah blah, and let it take best. over. You're 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 actually using it in a positive way, you know, and it allows more of it to come. Do you know what I mean? I think so. Mm-hmm. I, I definitely gen- think so. I, I genuinely do think so. I think you know, just I don't think I've ever been like that. I'm sure maybe people may beg to differ, but I don't <laughs> think you know I've ever really had a major. I mean, you see, load of egos within the, the music industry. So many, you know, <laughs> but I, I think. Your personality takes you away. You see all the guys with huge eagles, eagles, you know, and I just, I, I tend not to get drawn to that. I tend to just, way, I just, for some reason, it just end up just taking a left turn, you know, and, yeah. and, and, I, and I forget about it. I don't let mm-hmm. it, I don't even let it enter my headspace. Because you were saying earlier before the cameras went on, um, you were saying about like your energy and, and getting into the studio headspace and stuff like that and making sure that. It's a positive energy because the scene has got a lot of egos. It's got a lot of, I guess, negative hooks that can grab you and, and pull you down into a certain way or, you know, different elements of the scene and all that. Mm-hmm. How do you kind of manage that? As you say, you just kind of push it to the side. But I, t- I tend not to, I tend not to focus on what everybody else is doing. Mm-hmm. I tend just to try and focus 100% on what I'm doing. Because if you focus too much on what everybody else is doing, See, by the time you get close to them, poof, they're away doing something else. Mm-hmm. You know, when you've just spent all that time trying to do that, trying to get that. You know, when you know people, you know people say, oh, "I want to sound like Simon Parson, or I want to sound like this guy or that guy." Mm-hmm. You know, and I want to be on that label. And I'm thinking, so why do you want to sound like that guy and be on that label? They're not going to sign you. 
If you sound like that, they've already got that guy. Aye, aye, aye. You know, know. you need to be your own guy. That's that's a great way. Don't you? You know, you need to. to, That's true, but isn't it? You know, you know, you need to. But that's what you hear, though. People are like that. You know, I I want to be like that. I want to sound like that, and it's exactly that. It's It's, a lot of it's naivety. Early coming out in the scene early and and not going through all these different things, and Mm. and I, I guess it's maybe a starting point for some people. I want to sound like that because I admire that. It's never going to be that. Yeah, I mean, you know. Take influences from that and, ap- and, and apply it to your own stuff. Yeah. Yes. You know, I take influences. Oh, you all have over to. The place. You've you know, got I like to, a wee yeah. bit of that. Oh, I like what you're doing there. Mm-hmm. You know, and see by the time you get it on the screen, it sounds different anyway because mm-hmm. you've already tweaked mm-hmm. it to, to, to you, your, your own your way. Ears, yeah, you know, yeah. your own way. Yeah. You know, and then you start to forge your own little sound. Plus, I think it'd be a bit weird if you, if you had that one mate just listen to all his own tunes all the time, man. You're like, every time I'm in, you're listening to me. And you're like, I don't listen to him, Dale's mate, name Dale's. You know, you don't want that either. It's so funny. it's good to take influence. Yeah, it's funny because I don't actually listen to dance music out with my studio. Mm-hmm. But what are you listening not, to then? What are you listening to? You know, I'll just listen to a bit of Taiko or I'll, I'm, I've got talk sport on mm-hmm. all the time, just mm-hmm. listen to football. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I'm not as fo- I don't watch a lot of football. I'd rather play it, mm-hmm. but I'll listen to it in the car. Mm-hmm. So well, you know, and, and I very rarely will listen to dance music out right. with. That's interesting. The studio. It, do you find like maybe listening to like <clears throat> football or something else allows the ideas to cook in your head? Maybe dance music wise, it's giving it almost that creative brain a bit of a chance to like cook away while you're maybe listening to a podcast or talk sport or something like that. That headspace that you spoke about. Rather than having it with dance music. Yeah, I th- I, do you know, I think as you, get, as you get older and you've been in the scene a long time and you've listened to all forms Everything. of music for the last 20 years, see if I don't do that, I'm 24-7 mm-hmm. and I don't think that's healthy. No. I, I, I genuinely, I was like that, I'd say maybe, you know, right through the two, 2000 to 2010, 2012, it was just non-stop. I'd come out of the studio. I mean, I'd gone to the studio at nine in the morning. I'd go pick my kid up, drop her off. And you know, Stevie, mm-hmm. I'd be in the studio to five in the morning. Yeah. I'd be back up at eight. I'd drop Ari at school, straight back in the studio. And that was mm-hmm. seven days a week. Mm-hmm. And it gets to a point where it's not healthy. Mm-hmm. You know, then I started, I went back and started playing football again. You know, mm-hmm. and you just need that release. Yeah, and 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 in order to <clears throat> regenerate and get your headspace, get focused to go back into the studio. Probably you know? the, the breaks I find sometimes actually make you more productive and and give you better results. I think as so. opposed to hammering it, as you're saying, yeah. you know, yes, yeah, an important so. point. That also leads me on to everybody I know in the the dance music scene for Scotland goes on about how banging you are at football, mate. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, Will Atkinson, all of the all the guys. Even Stevens played a few games, and that's all I'm on. Like, oh, David ripped me last night, man. Pegged us five times, scored a goal with his shoulder, and I'm like, oh. he was uh, a lot like, mental. Uh, so how? how how are you so good at football, man? I want to see this. No, no, I mean, I'm, no. Do you know, it's just, it's just one of those things that I, I've always really enjoyed. You know, I've had two passions in life, which is, you know, football and music. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just... That's really good. You know, and it's something that I've... I'm kind of, I'm all or nothing. Mm-hmm. And, and anything I do, you know, it's just... A funny story just about all or nothing. Simon Foy, when me and Malachi were doing the debunk stuff, Malachi will probably remember this. We were doing, Simon Foy was working at Beat 106 at the time. Mm-hmm. And um, he was to do a jingle. I don't even know why I'm talking about this, but he was to do a jingle about the Dukes of Hazard or something. I spent a week in this thing. <laughs> <laughs> a jingle, bro. You know, and I turned it, I turned it into a tune. I can't, I'm sure it was a Dukes of Hazard. It was something stupid like that, you know. But mm-hmm. And Simon's like, mate, all I wanted it was, you know, all I needed to <laughs> cut it there and cut it there. I've got smashes and reverses and cuts and filters. Aye. And, you know, so, I mean, I, I mean... I, I, I think I just immerse myself when I start something. Uh-huh. I just kind of immerse myself in it and, and try and mm-hmm. do it to the best of my ability. And that mm-hmm. shows in what you've done throughout your career, though. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I uh, think from the start. You know, when did it start then? Like, let's go into that. Like, when did uh, you start did you, uh, really making? I guess the starting point was like you know you're on making music and you feel something kind of bubbling. You're like, here we go. I feel this. You know. 
what when did the, when, when did they get into production I, I sort of thing? So. I, I guess when, when did it really start? When you like, first make that switch, like, actually, I, I feel like I'm an artist here, kind of thing. I you could know? do this maybe full time. Like, when did you get your first break, maybe? Like, how did it come about? What, um, where were you? What happened? I think it was 1991. Um, I was DJing in the city. I was still 17. Mm-hmm. And I was DJing, and it's now called The Garage. All right, okay. You know, but it was called The Mafia prior to that. You know, so I was still in the army, and I, I think I owned about twenty records to my name, and I took a bag of records and a plastic Springburn suitcase, <laughs> plastic bag, up to the DJ in the Mayfair and asked him for a shot, and he says no, <laughs> but he says can I can I use your records because that DJ was was playing, he was still playing kind of late 80s stuff you know yeah. and it wasn't really that dancey it was an odd dance track but mm-hmm. I was turning up with Joey Beltram and mm-hmm. you know all that kind oh, of gear nice. you know and he started playing my tunes and the place was going absolutely tonto they hadn't kind of heard that style of music then four weeks later they gave me a wee shot gave me a wee 20 minutes then it wow. kind of progressed from yeah. that you know then I, I managed I knew I wanted to do that because prior to that, my dad used to buy me keyboards and every when I was young, they'd mm-hmm. be playing kind of riffs and stuff like that, you know. And so, um, yeah, so I came out of the army, I started DJing in the Mafia, and then I started getting an army gig. So there was, wasn't really that many guys playing that type of music. I sound like a right old dude, <laughs> you know what I mean? But there was, there was loads of guys playing it, but not that many guys. Like Mark Smith and, you know, Mark McLaughlin and all that were doing their thing. And I remember being in the Mafia, and I thought it was a DJ at that point. <laughs> and that's a right good pal of mine. And I always bring this up. I thought it was an amazing DJ. I'm like, I've been DJ in two months. I'm like, <laughs> I know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the man. Uh, you know, then Mark McLaughlin turned up because he knew the DJ as well. And he was using the pitch controls. Right. I was giving it, so that's what they're for. Right. I didn't even really. I th- the guy that showed me how to DJ used to put the vinyl on, put the pitches up to full. I was like, get in at the car, you put your seatbelt on and off you went. You know, I thought, right, okay, you put the record on, you put the pitch up to full, you know, and off you go. And I remember selling tapes at Mayfair and the girl giving it, by the way, your music's amazing, but it's really fast. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, clearly I'd had every track up at Aye. plus 12, you know, so anyway. <laughs> Mark, McGla- Mark McLaughlin, he turned up, he was mixing and he was doing his stuff and I was giving. He's a DJ. He's a DJ. I'm just playing at it, you know, and that's kind of, that's when I kind of went, right, okay, I kind of changed my, mm-hmm. my outlook. You learned, did you approach change. him? Did you speak to him a lot? We were mates at that they, point. Okay. Eh? We, we were only mates at that point. No, I didn't approach him. Just kind of playing I, it cool, watching from the back. Just hanging wow. over his shoulder. What is he doing? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but anyway, then I, then I, I hooked up with Trevor. I had heard I'd been doing the circuit in Glasgow and he was doing Bobby Jones. Went down to his done Bobby Jones then the hanger thing kicked off but he had an EPS 16 plus and in Sonic and that's the first time I'd seen something record something in and we made a thing called a hanger EP I think it came out in 91 on Core Records wow and then then I was like oh man this is this, this is, is this is what I, I mean I was just <clears throat> hooked I think you can you can show somebody or you can try and teach somebody something but see unless you're it was like that new bird we'll probably cut this bit out and you've got your hole for the first time <laughs> and all you wanted a day was shagger every day every minute uh-huh. <laughs> you know that way Aye. I just couldn't Aye. think about nothing else uh-huh. other than yeah yeah the produ- tunes uh, tunes and produce music and you know uh-huh. it just consumed me I yeah. couldn't you know it just it really mm-hmm. you know I just couldn't think of anything else but that yeah. wow you know it was incredible uh, yeah, and, and that's kind of. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm digressing. No, 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 no perfect. No, 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 it's yeah. good because it's stuff I've not he- even heard. Yeah, right where that kind of you, you get hooked in, you know. Yeah, that's I mean, cool. I think I think you need that, but don't you? You need mm-hmm. in, in order to really progress in something, you need to be really. Well, I love for it. You need a oh, real. Man, you need to be obsession obsessed by yeah. it, you know. And, and that's I was obsessed by it from an early age. Talk us through the sort of production how, how how like you know what the setup would have been like then the, the, the i mean first that track? was that was the first track was just one keyboard that keyboard done everything 
so I'd be there on the vinyl, just sampling records. Trevor be recording it in, mm -hmm. and the, the sequencer was was in. So you step one, we bit of kick drum. Step two, kick drum hi hat. Wow. Step so you could end up with a hundred sequences mm -hmm. to get that tune done, and that blew my mind. I was just giving it, my God, that's mm -hmm. just mind blowing. Mm -hmm. Wow. Off the back of that, my twenty first birthday. Um. I bought a sampler, an S950, from Pianos and Keyboards, a wee house in Alma, 550 quid. I had a dodgy effects unit for Tommy Gorman, who was the sound guy in Hangar. Mm -hmm. It only came out one side. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I had an eight-channel mixing desk, and I think I had about two or three seconds sample time. So all my early hardcore stuff, Never had a crash in it mm -hmm. because there wasn't enough space for it. Right. There wasn't enough sample time. All I had enough was for a kick drum, a snare. It wasn't even a clap. Kick drum, snare, a stab. So there may have, maybe have been about five or six things in my tracks. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and I remember signing a track to Dwarf Records Combined. That's when I thought... You'd made it. I'm, I'm getting there. Mm -hmm. I think when I thought I'd made it, was when I'd done my first gig over in Holland. Because there couldn't have been that many, maybe Scott Brown, myself, Mark mm -hmm. Smith. Yeah. Don't think any of the English guys were doing gigs over in Scotland. <clears throat> and they flew me over there and I'd done a, a thing called Ray the City for about 20,000 people. Mm -hmm. Wow. And it just, wow. I was only 20, 21. I know, I know there's a lot of young DJs nowadays touring the world at that age, but back then I That's don't think there was that off. many, many guys doing that. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think... <clears throat> yeah, I think at that point I thought, pff, you know, I could really... And by that time I'd done Resurrection, I'd done Hangar 13, you know, I'd done gigs down south. I didn't do that many gigs down south, to be fair. Um, but, you know, I kind of I kind of done what I'd kind of set out to do in mm -hmm. Scotland, you know, and I was quite... I'm quite prolific in the studio, and I was quite prolific back then as well, you know, I was turning out track after track after track after track, just kind of flooding the market. Mm -hmm. To the point where, you know, probably saturated it a bit, but fucking by God, you got people, your name out people there. knew my name at that point, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so I mean, I had a wee. Then, it, then, we're talking earlier. I went to the Prince's Trust, mm -hmm. you know, and um, but I'd already been releasing stuff, so I wasn't getting into the Prince's Trust sitting in front like, of that panel, aye. trying to flannel my way through it. You know, they were asking me a question. I was just boom. Mm -hmm. Boom, boom, and they were blown away that I was writing stuff. That's a wee guy for sight hall, yeah. staying in the yeah, high yeah, flats, yeah. trying to do his thing. Mm -hmm. You know, all my mates were all going out and doing their thing, and I'm in my, my living room just banging it out, number eleven. <laughs> you know, just smashing it out. You know, and I had to restudio my dad's um, work as well. But um, that's cool. Yeah, that's. Um, it's funny you mentioned the Princess Trust thing. It was an exact situation there when you're faced with the panel, but I had ran like culture before yeah. and I had the kind of experience. So every question, there was not anything I was phased by. I was like, well, aye, there you go. There's that experience. Yeah, yeah. Check that out. There's yeah. that newspaper clip. Yeah. There's this idea. There's that. Oh, there's my books there. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? You'd yeah. kind of... Yeah. It was easy. You know, it's, you know, you're not going in there trying to pull the wool over their eyes. You know, no, you're no. going in there with a, a plan. You're focused. Mm -hmm. You know, you're mentally totally focused. focused. I think focus is what they picked up on, obviously, from yourself. Yeah. You know, and obviously myself as well, because yeah. they, they gave me the help and still working with them today. Do you know, do you know the only thing, the only thing that stuck in my throat with the Prince's Trust, and they're, they're incredible, right? It's a stupid thing. But my mate, who wasn't, he wasn't as passionate as me, mm -hmm. you know, he actually took my business plan and copied it and went and, so he was kind of from more of an affluent area than I was. Right. And I applied for the thousand pound grant yeah, on top yeah. of the soft loan. Mm -hmm. And I never got it because they never said they said Sight Hall wasn't a deprived enough area. Right. Don't know where they got that from. They, <laughs> they must have got it mixed up with some other housing scheme in the West End or something. <laughs> I must have spelt the name incorrectly or something like that. And he was from a more affluent area and he, he got, got the he get the he get a thousand pounds. So Princess Trust, mm -hmm. I want my grand. <laughs> there you go. The I message is out. The message mm. is out. <laughs> that is weird. Oh, that's weird. So yeah. you mentioned there about like the, the Scottish scene and like there wasn't many DJs from England and stuff, but there was a stark difference in the parties up in Scotland, wasn't there? Like I was, we had John Mancini on. He was talking about it, 
and he was saying there was something else up with Resurrection and, you know, it was just mental up in Scotland for, yeah. I yeah. guess, DJ's output and, like, Carol Cox, I guess, played yeah. as well, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, play? he played the big bang in the SECC, didn't he? Mm. Yeah, he so there was also a, a particular buzz with the Scottish... Aye, well, he uh, said as well rave scene, you know? that they were, like, the Scots were were wiping the floor with the Englishman back in the day. I, th I mean, the, Sc the Scottish scene had a unique sound. It kind of, again, it, Still goes does. Back, it goes back to production and stuff like that. You know, you need to create your own sound. And I think Aye. the guys within Scotland, I mean, Scott Brown was, I know we're, we're talking about the other stuff, but Scott Brown was a huge influence in me. You know, when we, we, we had the hangar show a few, a few about last month, you know, and, and Scott sent me, I, I forgot half the tracks I actually wrote in his labels, and he sent me a, a folder. Oh, your stuff on it? All the, wow. the stuff on I was like, oh, I forgot about that. I'm getting, fuck me, that sounds like Scott Brown. But so does that, <laughs> and so does that, you know, like. Yeah, you know, yeah. I, I was a heavy influence. A huge influence in me, in my, my sound. Yeah. Early. But I was, I was kind of quite a loner back then. Mm -hmm. I just kind of. Done your own thing? I, my mate, my, my, my mate Pad, you know, he's really close friend how do you know how do you know network with this guy and network with that guy and I'm just going they're not my type of guys you know I don't want to just mm -hmm. go and network with them for the sake of it mm -hmm. I don't need to mm -hmm. I'm happy doing my my stuff yeah you know in my wee bubble fair creating enough. my sound fair enough you know and it, it wasn't a case that I didn't want to socialise I did want to socialise but they just want the had to be the right people I had to be the right people you know that I wanted to socialise with you know so I mean I kind of just, I was kind of flying solo mm -hmm. back in the day. You know, of course, you know, I was friends with Mark Smith and Mark McLaughlin and stuff like that, you know, but I was quite, and I, I was, me and Mark have a laugh about it, and I was like, was that folk, was that, goes back to, you know, being all in, I says, was that, was that quite determined and focused back then? Because you look back and you think you weren't, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, I, you know, Jesus <laughs> Christ, Dave, you know, there was, if there was a, a person more focused than you at that p particular um, time, you know, point him out. Yeah, it'd be hard to find. <laughs> you know, you know, so, I, I suppose that was, I mean, the, the scene, again, Scotland kind of created its own scene, I think, it had that kind of, then the English guys kind of started to infiltrate it and steal, you know, because mm -hmm. prior to that, English guys, it was just breakbeats, and then they started sticking a kick drum on it, and mm -hmm. they started sticking a bass line on it. Yeah. You know, and then... It's evolved into yeah. what it is today. Yeah, yeah evolved. You know. What John was saying um, was like the location of like Scotland, which is quite interesting. It was like the location of Scotland kind of held back Scottish DJs sometimes getting the big international gigs when it all kicked off because London was like the centre, kind of centre. People were there networking. You maybe yeah. had guys for obviously not for yourself. You were in Holland and doing all of the world and stuff like that. But like for him, maybe he m missed out in some of the. The opportunities that maybe guys in London were getting just due to maybe promoters for America or such and such being in London, as opposed to coming up north of the border, you know. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, I, I, back in the day in the nineties, I get my gigs abroad because of the music that I was releasing. Mm. That's and I, That's I think it. it's still it's still like that. Yeah, yeah. I agree. You know, whereas locally. You get booked because you're a good DJ. That's right, aye. You all get Makes booked. Sense. It was back then, you get booked on your ability as a DJ, a turntablist, mm -hmm. reading a crowd. Yep. You didn't necessarily get booked locally. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I get booked locally because I played Hang 13, mm -hmm. or I'd done Resurrection, or I'd done this event, or I'd yeah. done that event. Whereas people abroad, they don't know. There was no social media, so they don't know you're doing... They only know you from a tune, you've a released. tune that you've released yeah. on a Dutch label, yeah, or absolutely, or another label. So that's, I, I, I think, for me personally, that's how you get the gigs mm -hmm. back then. I don't think being in Scotland necessarily held you, back. Hind, held uh, you mm. back or hindered you. That's a great point. Maybe if you weren't making gigs. music, maybe if you were just on the, the DJ scene, massive in the DJ scene, as you say, music does transcend those borders a, a bit, doesn't it? Where you can access a label I suppose that's exactly the same as now isn't it it is it, is, it hasn't changed exactly same. it hasn't changed and maybe if you were down in London though and you were just a DJ you do have more opportunities Aye. to be seen right, that so because of the social yeah. media thing you wouldn't see the Rectify the Hangar 13 all yeah. that sort of stuff so if you were at least in London you've got more options again and then it could maybe grow but I think you're absolutely right it's, it's down to the music you release 100% Aye. I think so and it obviously so, still is like that to this day 
you know. I, I, I think so, you know, totally. You know, I, I genuinely do believe that. I think, you know, you need to be releasing music in order mm -hmm. to, to be touring. Mm -hmm. What's your thoughts on, like, the Scottish scene now? Because it's evolved so much. I mean, um, it's so, I mean, even since we've been I kind mean, of palling about, it's changed yeah. so much. Yeah, you know? I, th I mean, I think, I still, there's loads of producers in Scotland, loads of incredible producers you had Harvey on before, you know, you get Slam, you've got Jackmaster, you know, I'm just skimming the surface here, mm -hmm. you know, you've got Will doing his thing, mm -hmm. you know, you're doing your thing, Stu B and Gary, second phase boys are doing their thing. And a trans, from a trans point of view, I don't think it's as healthy mm -hmm. as it could be. I'd like to see Personally, I'd like to see more trans producers in Scotland, but mm -hmm. as a whole, I think the Scottish scene is, will always be kind of, it's always there, it's always ticking along, it's mm -hmm. always doing its thing, mm -hmm. you know. It's very difficult, you know, for people nowadays, you need to dedicate so much time and effort and energy mm -hmm. in the studio. It's back to being pass passionate and obsessive about the whole thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd like to see, I think it's in a healthy state, you know, you've got those gigs every weekend. Yeah. SWG3, you know, you know, there's, you know, there is, I think there's loads of guys doing their stuff. I think it's healthy. It could mm -hmm. be healthier. Everything could be healthier, but I, I genuinely do believe, I suppose that the EDM thing kind of took the wind out the sails for a wee bit there, didn't it? But again, with the EDM thing, you know, it's kind of, you've got big kind of EDM type pop guys. Mm -hmm. filling mm -hmm. places you know but it makes those wee underground parties all the more cooler mm -hmm. and all the more better you know mm. so Aye. you know you know people are into that people are into that I think get back to your question I think the Scottish scene is, is, is healthy and I think it will <laughs> always continue to be healthy as long as you've got good people mm -hmm. with a vision and passionate yep. about putting on good parties releasing good music you know and, and you know and just being passionate about their trade. The thing as well, what's great about the scene and that kind of mindset is like the more people that are passionate, put the energy in, that are good at it, put the time in, the health of the scene is in general, whether that's a promoter putting on a night that's got the quirky details in the night that people go to, they talk about it, that adds to the scene in general, or whether it's yourself putting out good music or us running the studio or whatever it may be, yeah. it all adds and there's like enough stuff there for everyone and the more people actually putting in good stuff, good work, good output, the better, mm -hmm. the healthier, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is a good thing. I think a lot of people sometimes get mixed up and think, you know, I, I want to hold all this for myself or, you know, I, I don't want them to be involved in it or this, that and the other. There's too many people doing that. But really, competition breeds more good stuff. Oh, quality, I think eh? so. You keeps, I mean? you, keeps you on your toes. It does. You know, I could, I could sit there every day and just tyre kick in the mm -hmm. studio, you know, and just rest on my laurels. But I hear other guys... Give it, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. I be on my toes all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, and it strives me to be a better producer, mm -hmm. to be, I don't know, just better at generating new techniques in the studio that I can apply to all my different styles of yeah. music that are, yeah, that, yeah. that are right. You know, you need to be on your toes all the time. Yeah, so you do. absolutely. You said something earlier that would be good to go over again. You said about, like, going into the studio and, and a lot of people kind of get tracks over the line, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And uh, it's about like the, the backpacking analogy. Right, okay. If you want to go over that one, I mean, I mean, so. I mean, it's, I mean, I don't like, you know, it's a belter. That was a new one for me. <laughs> I like so it. I like it. It's just like, you know, I think. I mean, people I ask people when when they when they go into the studio, why is it even in people coming in if they want me to kind of I do the odd engineering track here and there, what is it you're looking to get out of? People come into the studio. I want to write a tune. All right, cool. See, when we write that tune and you go away and you kind of get it signed because you don't know what style you want to do, mm -hmm. don't come back and mm -hmm. nip my nut, mm -hmm. you know, and ask me. It's I true. Can I get that signed? You know, it's, I think you need to ask yourself, what is it I'm trying to get out of the music industry? Mm -hmm. You know, and you, you need to be able to train your brain to get from point A to point mm -hmm. B. And mm -hmm. I think you need to make sure before, like we said, before you go hill walking, Mm -hmm. You've got all your stuff that you need in your backpack. Yeah. You know, just in case you need it. When you get to that point, right, mm -hmm. it's pissing down, better put the tent up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. You know, 
I probably said the analogy better earlier. Well, you know what, what you I mean? were saying, what you're saying was like once once you're out and then you realise you forgot something Aye. important that you needed, yeah. you'll no forget it the next, the next time, time yeah. and you just keep adding stuff into your bag, <laughs> yeah, yeah. your mental bag, yeah, if you yeah, like. Yeah, that's true. You know, just I just getting that kind of armory built up before you. And it's not giving up. Harvey said the exact same thing. It's like finish every single thing you start. Like finish it yeah. and put it away. You don't need to send everything out. No. Just finish it because you'll learn something that gets you from that point A to point B to train B, your brain that then next project in a week or two weeks or a year's time that'll be up there it'll be yeah. in that backpack yeah yeah. You know I, mean? I think I think you know I think a lot of people go into the studio and they think they see all these flashing lights and they, and they make it they think because they see all these flashing lights and all these kind of sliders and all that it has to be difficult too many people go in there and, and, and think it's got to be difficult. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, make it simplify it and make it as easy. When I go into the studio, I just think work. We would have some people want to go in there. They want to build a big five guy. They want to sit there all night, you know, and just kid on their Vangelis, mm -hmm. you know, and, 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 and sound design. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So go, on you go, mate. Go and sound design. But see, every time you go into that studio, that's all you're going to do. Mm -hmm. It's just going to be like an opium den, and you're going to be thinking you're, <laughs> you're Van Gaal, you know, <laughs> sitting there just being like, yeah, yeah. man, I'm amazing, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas if you go in there and you start training your brain mm -hmm. to, to churn, to churn out now, mm -hmm. to get to point A yeah, and point yeah. B, and just constantly do that, you know, it'll become natural to you, and it'll get, like we said, it'll get better and better every time you do that. I mean, I guess it's a, a part to play, especially nowadays, like with the access for people, like, you know, anybody can really access the equipment or stuff like that, you know, you can do it from a laptop, right? Yeah. And it's like, um, I think attention span, especially now, is so low with people that like, you know, like the Netflix generation where it's like you spend more time looking for something to watch than actually watching something because you've got that much choice. It's yeah. like, even with that, it's like you get how so many producers that we see clients as well that are like, they just can't get out a loop phase. You know, and they're like, oh, I've got a tune here. It's like, well, you've actually got a loop. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to, how, how are we going to actually going to get out of there? Because you're just going to move on from one loop to the next. And I've got guys that are saying, oh, I've got 200 projects. But none of them are done Finish. so you actually don't have you know you need to actually just get one done and that that is so important so like that they're getting from a to b and just focusing on it not doing anything else other than that i think is so important to train the brain mm. of getting something finished yeah. I mean, or at least too close i mean uh, yeah but people give up too easily sometimes exactly don't they? You yeah, know, yeah i'm i'm one of these guys i get to a point and if i do kind of get a wee bit stuck I'm not one of these guys that go, I'm gonna go I'm gonna go for a walk. I, I don't do that. Right. I don't let it beat me. Mm -hmm. And I keep chipping and I keep I keep hammering away at that mm -hmm. wall. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll eventually get through it. Mm -hmm. You know, but I think that mental strength it takes you to get through there. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like yeah. another one of my crap analogies. See when you're in the army and you think you're fit. They take you beyond that and you don't know. You don't know what it's like to be fit until you get beyond that point. You know, I think in order to get super fit, you need to be sick. You need to stress your body and take it to the a point of no return. And I think if you keep on going in the studio, this is a pure shite analogy. I've just went away in a tangent. No, no, no. You're making it analogy. You're making sense. You know, you, know you, you sometimes need to <laughs> just keep kind of hammering away and you know what to do the next time when you get there. You won't know how far to go unless you go that far. Absolutely. You know, in that point in the track, and if you keep on getting away, and right, I'll, I'll come back, you'll still be sitting there a yeah. year later. You know, just keep forging on, keep on smashing that ball, and it'll eventually come down. Mm -hmm. And you'll know how much and how far you need to go sometimes. Once you've went there. Once you've went there. No, I like that. I like you that. You know, it's just... That's brilliant. You know, it's just... Mm. I think... I do. I think you need to... If for me, if you're passing, I'm, I'm not going to let this beat me. I'm going to get this over the line. It may not be the best track that I write, mm -hmm. but I'm going to get it over the line mm -hmm. and I'll move on to the next one. Because mm -hmm. see, if I don't, it just eats away at me at night mm -hmm. and eats away and I'm just giving it, fuck, man, this fucking breakdown's driving me nuts, man. <laughs> <laughs> Three, four days into it and I'm just getting it. I need to get this finished, you mm -hmm. know, and it's just, I need to get it finished. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people say, when, do you, when again, when, when do you think, when, when, when's a track finished? Sometimes a track's never finished. Yeah. You just need to abandon it. 
get it done and abandon it. Because that, that track, you know, there's many tracks that I've sent away to labels and thought, never sign that. And you've been sending them stuff for ages and ages and ages. This is the best thing I've done. Boom. That's not for us. Then you're getting up, right, okay, I'll send this one away. That one, it's took you, you know, you've been kind of gone mental a bit and it, before you know it, they've, they've signed it, you know what and it wasn't the one you're expecting? Aye, it wasn't the one you're expecting. I think one in particular, I signed my first track to Subculture. I think it was called Hope You're Okay. Mm-hmm. And I just sent him it. John, I've been trying to get something on Subculture. It's a great label. Mm-hmm. I love what John does. He's got his sound, you know, and it's that's his sound, you know. And I sent it to him. Just in the off chance, they get back to me, oh, dear, that's amazing, I'm getting it. Oh man, I can't believe he signed that. You know, I mean, I knew it was a decent track, you know, mm-hmm. but I just didn't you know. You know, again, that was one of the tracks that I probably wouldn't have finished. Mm-hmm. You know, but I got it over the line. You know, mm-hmm. it took me. It was a labour of love, but I got got it over the line, and I got it to him. And I got it to the label, and I was delighted with the outcome. Yeah. You know, and again, it just all boils down to getting into the studio, getting that mindset right, and training your brain to get to, to from point A to point B. Yeah. You 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 told me that years ago as well. You're like um. You know, the tracks that you don't think will go anywhere sometimes are the ones that everyone loves. Do you know what I mean? Are the ones you rattle out in in an afternoon. Take you, you know, no long at all. Or like... They're the ones. People lap it up, you know? It's it's so funny how it works. But for me, this is what the podcast is all about, though, is like guys that don't have the experience that are like listening to you guys who who have had experience yourself and all, Dave, I mean, releasing for 91. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's invaluable for them to hear this for a guy like yourself because without that, they are just making all the mistakes you guys have made on the way to where you're at now. Which is important that they do that as well. 100%. And it's actually listening and saying, right, okay, I need to get out of the loop stage or whatever. I need to finish my tracks. I need to beat my head against the wall and get it done. I mean, for us, to be fair, in a wee bit of a different sense, we will probably go and take that wee break and go get that wee walk, Mm -hmm. come back and refresh and smash it. Yeah. You know, for I think it's it's down to... Different brains. Yeah, different brains. You know, that... Because it was just interesting because totally yeah. you Stubby's like that. He he won't. I mean, we've said to him even just to go out, like go and get a bit of fresh air, take a break, mm-hmm. and like uh, he he he'll never usually do it. But he'll be he'll be battling with himself for yeah. ages, yeah. and he'll sit on something for two or three. And I weeks. think he's probably picked it up from you though. Mm-hmm. Work, I working with you so many times early on because mm-hmm. he's even said that you know. Yeah, yeah. Because me I, and you both, me and Stuart and Gary worked for you at mm-hmm. the very start. Do you know what's yeah. funny? Harvey McKay said to me last week. I sent him a new tune and he's like loving this and he's like you know what though I can hear Davey Forbes in there <laughs> and I'm like honestly <laughs> really honestly really? honestly wow, honestly I'll let you hear it and I was like wowee I don't have this the slightest idea how mm-hmm. but there's something that, there's funny. something happening you've had an effect on everyone <laughs> Davey it's, you know but what's that all about that's it's brilliant. insane I don't know I can't put my finger on it you know well Harvey actually mentioned you were speaking about it earlier and uh, we had him on the podcast for episode 19 great guy legend man hilarious yeah. you know and um, one of the things that really stuck with us that we spoke mm-hmm. about earlier which I'm um, I'm proud of you you know, I suppose is <laughs> is a, a, a way of a way of putting it. You know, is like he remembers, you know, giving you some music right when he was starting out. So he was probably making loads of nonsense, mm-hmm. sending you stuff, and he always kind of he was like, "Look, I always remember Davy's response was kind of like, look, wee man, keep doing what you're doing. You need to figure out exactly what it is you're doing because you've got about ten different tracks in one track. <laughs> you know, just keep it focused." Yeah. And now you look at somebody like Harvey McKay, where he's at in the scene now, right? So how long ago was that he would have sent you that, you reckon? I'd have said maybe maybe Harvey might say different, but I think it was maybe 2004. Right. It might have been earlier than that, 2003. So but maybe, what he did is right. he gave me a CD with about 10 tracks on it, I think, mm-hmm. but it was like drum and bass and it was a bit of that. It was an it was album. A bit of that. It was an album of all different <laughs> stuff. And all I did was say to him, oh, amazing, Harvey, pick one style of music that you're into and, and focus on that and get to a stage where you're giving it, pff, smashing it. Yeah. You know, I'm really competent in that style of music. Then go and do mm-hmm. all your other wee bits because you're, you're, forged, you're yeah. forging in your career. But learn the craft first. Just learn it. Get get the sound that you're into first and foremost, and hey, aye, by by God, 
did he go and find his sound? You know? I, I mean, he's smashing it now, one of the biggest, you know. And, and again, though, it's just, it's, it's amazing for him because the effect you had on him back then with that, he said that he's now carried that on when we guys are sending him stuff. Mm-hmm. He'll always try and find time and give it's back. Funny, he actually said that, you know, it's like, it's what Davey said to me then. It's how exactly I treat everyone coming to me now. That's great. It's amazing, you know, no, it's amazing. No, no, it totally is. I know. Why did you get that for football with me? <laughs> <laughs> he trained me a wee bit and I knew I, knew I know how to play you know? <laughs> pegging folk <laughs> well that's amazing though it, it shows you how kind of I guess tight knit the Scottish scene is though and if everyone does band together and help each other out you know you don't know what conversation somebody might take one day and let it implement their life in a positive way and all that's why it's good to just carry yourself every day and you know try and keep it positive do you know yeah I mean Glasgow's a village Aye. Let's be honest, isn't it? You know, it's just a, a big giant village. Everybody mm. pretty much knows everybody within mm-hmm. the scene, you know, and thankfully, you know, everybody pretty much kind of gets on me, so. Mm-hmm. I mean, the underground is just a circle, you know what I mean? <laughs> It's just like, it's so true. It's not that complex. It's not that complex. Just <laughs> shut on it. You don't need to move and you'll end up back where you were. <laughs> no Victoria lines, no Trafalgar's, no. Just, just a circle, mate. Oh, that'll do. Yeah. A long circle, nice whatever. The oval. <laughs> yeah, it is. So, um, obviously, you've got the Davy Forbes mm-hmm. thing, right? That's your main guy, yeah. right? That's yeah. you, yeah. right? Yeah. That's yeah. Davy, right? Trance, yes. hard style. Not hard style, but like, you know, hard, hard trance. Hard you know, yeah, yeah. really Tech upbeat, trends, yeah. melodic Techie as well. Stuff, yeah. um, tell us a wee bit more about some of your aliases you've got there, because some people don't know, and obviously people that know know, but a lot of people probably don't know that you've got some absolutely class stuff under some of your aliases as well. Yeah, I get more aliases than the Taliban. Like. <laughs> 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 the Taliban soldier. No, no, yeah, yeah. Um, do you know, um, I think the most. I, I, I think that the the alias that I really enjoy working on is the Hal Stucker stuff. Tell us about that then. It's it's more. I mean, it's stuff that I started. I started. Um, it was an alias I actually started in 1999. Believe it or not, and I released a track on Telica Records, Pablo Gargano's label back then. Citizens and another track called Soft Ceiling and a couple of other tracks, but I shelved it. And um, a couple of years ago. I think it was no, I think it was more than that, but four years ago, believe it or not. I done a wee track, it was kinda quite pretty, quite melodic, kinda cute sounds, and I sent it to Ruben at Statement at Armada and he's like, mate, oh man, this is amazing. But you know that way when I was writing the track, I was giving it this is amazing. Mm-hmm. You know, I was really, really digging it. It was a wee track called Coro. And um, you know, that kinda kicked off the the Hal Stucker sound, but I didn't mean for it to create a wee sound like that, but I've created a kind of wee sound mm-hmm. for Hal Stucky, you know, it's quite a unique, as it unique nowadays, but it's unique in my ears, you know, Aye, the wee absolutely. sounds, it's unique, it's different from the sounds that I'm using yeah, on normally. other tracks, you know, and, and other producers are, that are doing the harder stuff for us. Where are you getting that sound from? Mm-hmm. Or where you get, and it's just maybe sounds from synths that you're using, but I've just kind of stumbled across these sounds that work within... Yeah. This kind of genre, kind of wee quirky Hal Stucker sound that mm-hmm. I've kind of mm-hmm. found myself. But yeah, so I started doing three, four, five tracks for um, statement records. But I don't know if any, any of you, any of the people watching this, know of a band called Tycho. Yeah, they Tycho. certainly do, you know. Unbelievable. <clears throat> I'm heavily influenced by what this guy's doing. And mm. I've never really been a fanboy of anybody. Your U2s and your Coldplay's, I like it. But I'm no giving it. But the first time I heard this Tycho guy, I was giving. It, I was sitting in the club, sitting in the Mulberry Bar in Pollockshaws Road, and I was reading the paper, and I heard this track. And I was giving it. It's amazing. And then I heard another one. I was like, What's that? The last guy. It's amazing how you pick up. Mm-hmm. It was just a wee bit different part of the sound. If I was up in the north of the city, it'd have been George Bowie. But with all the suicide, yeah, you know, it's Trafungo. <laughs> it was a wee bit of Tycho. We had a So yeah, I kind of I'm heavily in, influenced by the that kind of sound, and that's kind of filtered over to the house Tucker sound. These melodies and you know the Tycho sound. I don't know where the beginning is, and I don't know where the end is. I don't know where the breakdown is. 
Mm. So Still very ambient. Yeah, it's, it's progressive, isn't it? Just progresses yeah. on. So <coughs> progressive chill. Then we oh, then really we, we done the the, the track on uh, Future Sound of Egypt. You know, it's kind of a wee continuation of yeah. You know, yeah, just yeah. kind Great of tune, man. The sort of vibe. Another one of those that we done two four hour sessions. Aye, aye, on. aye it was just track smash, tune, so man. It was, it's just, aye, just, aye, it's just again, it's just. You're not conforming to any particular sound, in it? You know, but it referenced nothing. Just it, went in, and it just flew. And it blew together. my, it blew my mind that they actually signed that. But mm. I can see why they signed it. We're no sitting here, kind of rubbing each other, or slapping uh, each other on the yeah. back. But you, it, when you say, "Look, FSO, you want to sign that?" I was kind of wow. Mm. Mm-hmm. Really? It's just, pff, you know. But then listening to it, you know, you can understand why this because it sounded nothing like. They've put it before, yeah, and it still had that richness and that kind of vibe about it. That yeah. it was definitely worth it. But I think they, they probably signed it because that's the route they wanted to take. Yeah, and that was the first track that stood out to them in terms of being proper progressive. Progressive, in my opinion. No, I think you're yeah. right. And it's not progressive trance, really, what they were putting out because we weren't really digging the stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but they signed it and went, man, this is blowing our minds in the office here. Yeah. We want to take it. And I guess Paul Thomas has went down a route. Yeah, the UV, UV stuff. Well, it's yeah. not too close, but it's kind of down a route, sort of like underground progressive, yeah. maybe. So maybe that was a decision. But I, Again, it goes back yeah. to what we were talking about earlier, though. Like, um, people are like, I want a sound like this. And it's like, well, that's not going to work because they've got that mm-hmm. sound. Yeah. So were you guys, you weren't uh, trying to impersonate any of them. Like, let's pave a new sound and yeah. see if they take it. And they did yeah. because you'd done your own thing. Yeah. We were just loving the sounds, I remember. It's a tune you and were a just half. playing chords and we threw up Omnisphere. And then the music just t- the track wrote itself yeah. almost. Yeah, I mean, it just came together. I, yeah. I mean, we were playing kind of melodies and that stuff that weren't necessarily what you would call you would they would suit in a trance track. Mm. You know, it was more a do you know what? I don't even know what kind of sound it was. Sort of reversing pianos and all that was, ah, it was kind of out really there, was, isn't it? You yeah, know yeah. what I mean? But then I, I kind of I had four of the type of tracks sitting there. Mm-hmm. And I didn't really know what was going on. I, I didn't really know. And I sent Rich Solarstone had been asking me to do, it's still only how stuck have I, but Rich Solarstone had asked me to do a track for Pure Trans for, for quite a while. Mm. And I just didn't want to send him a, a token trans 138. Oh, there you go, Rich. You know, thanks for the opportunity. You know, I sent him the four tracks that I had sitting there and just get back to me. Oh, these are amazing. Mm-hmm. What is it you want to do with these? Mm-hmm. I was going, I don't know, Rich. I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd love to do an album. Mm-hmm. It's like, right, go and do it. Amazing. You know, and I gave you the wee nudge. It just gave me the wee nudge. I, I wanted to do it. I'd let Danny McCaskill, I'm, 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 I'm dropping names here, I, I, you know, but through a mate of mine who, who stays in the same flat, uh-huh. and Paul was playing the tracks, and obviously Danny's a huge, yeah. you know, one of the top guy in, in, his, in his field, what he does. And Danny popped his head into the, 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 the room and says, What's that you're playing? And Paul just went, Oh, that's one of my mates. And I'd love that for one of my videos. I'm like, Paul, get that track one of his videos. <laughs> the guys get more videos and the guy that jumped out of space and stuff like uh, that, more views yeah, on yeah. YouTube, you know. And I'm giving it, I met Danny's a great guy and Duncan, all the rest of the guys that do the drop and roll. You know, all the boys from the. I, we're we're actually like soon going to have Chris Kyle on the show. Oh, who, you know, he's coming on soon. It's funny, again, I'll finish the house, Tucker, and we'll go into just quickly about Chris Aye, Kyle. Please do, yeah. Um, but yeah, so I ended up getting the, the whole Stucker album over the line, you know, and, and, and you know, anybody that knows, I, anybody that knows Rich Sawstone knows how an amazing, how such an amazing guy he is, his outlook and music and mm-hmm. just he's very comfortable in his own, his own vibe, vibe you yeah, know yeah. that, he's not, again, when going, he's not trying to be that, Whoever he's trying to be, he's yeah. just being himself. Mm-hmm. You know, he's being himself in his press shots. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's being himself. Yeah, that's with, what it's with, all about. Releasing his music, his labels, and he's just being himself. You know, and and and, and that's what I felt. I felt really re- refreshing. Brilliant. When I was talking to him, you know, I felt really confident that you know you I, had free reign to do your I own free thing. Free to do my own thing and get get the the album out there. So yeah, I done the album and he he, he put a lot of work in it. It came out a few months ago. You know, and it's something. I'm really proud of you know I, I you know I spent I, I say I spent loads of time on it but again it's one of those things that you can listen to in the car or I know it's cliche again but it's one of the, it's genuinely one of those I mean the first track in the album's like ten minute long and the, the kick drum doesn't come in until five minutes 
you know, Tai Chou style. Aye, it's just you know, it's just you know, it's that's just, cool though. Aye, it's just. Try to but do that's the whole thing different. an album, isn't it? That's it. You're taking them on the journey. Like mm -hmm. we we always kind of uh, base it on like, can you drive round the loch with it, kind of thing? Yeah. And yeah, it sounds a, like an that's album. A reference point. Uh, <laughs> it's like right, let's drive round the loch, listen to this mix, or uh -huh. listen to some of these tunes and get ideas. You know. So yeah. I mean, I, I I know from this how stuck stuff I've heard and the collab you guys done, which yeah. is still amazing. Um, it's it's going to be like that. Do you know what I mean? Aye, that's ex it's exactly like that. You know, I'm trying. I'm using a lot of sounds that I wouldn't normally use anywhere else in any of my other productions. You know, really. I mean, uh, if nobody's checked out any of your budding producers out there, if if, if you've not checked out Omnisphere, you mm -hmm. know, I would advise you to go and. For me, anyway, it kind of transformed the Hal Stucker sound. You know, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. Hal Stucker is based on be a Tycho and Omnisphere. Mm -hmm. You know, and and just having the, the limited ability to play really nice kind of melodies. Yeah, it feels like you've got a full orchestra at your fingertips. It does, mm -hmm. it? You know, some of the strings on it, you're just, it's just, mm -hmm. the sound quality of, of the machine is just, it's mind-blowing. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, it's not that, t it's, for me, it's not that synth that you can use in the, the harder gear. I think it's got to be more the kind of progressive gear. Mm -hmm. You know, the progressive kind of, Rich sounds. Yeah, rich sounds, you know, and mm -hmm. the depth and the warmth and some of the sounds is mind blowing sort of this. Sebroff. Big Sebers there. What's happening there? That's that, the techno that, that's, this, isn't it? Aye, that's the, the aye. Do you know what, it's funny because it was doing well. I mean, I mind when I first started the Sebroff alias, you know, it was kind of when Lutz and Kirps and Techno was quite popular mm -hmm. at that point when Spectre and all that was mm -hmm. really starting to, mm -hmm. to kick off and the guys are still smash it, but they were starting to really mm -hmm. just come into the mm -hmm. scene at that point. You know, writing monitor and I know it's still like that. <laughs> it's still a like killer sound. So it was monitor. It's, it's amazing it how it stands out. It's, I don't know what was happening in the studio that day for that tune to happen. The tune you can never find anywhere. It's mm -hmm. nowhere. Yeah. People still ask me. It's got. It's not on the internet. I don't think. No, I don't. It's I, just no. Have I mean, you still got it? Yeah, I mean, it's funny how that track came about. It's, cra it's a crazy, so it's a you that's a crazy kind of techno -y type of Sandy Van Duerne type mm -hmm. track. And that that full track, the bass line, everything about that track was made off of anybody that's got a virus. There's a preset in the virus, and I called it Bendy. I think it is called Bendy Hats. So when you, you run the hats on 16s, mm -hmm. it goes... Mm -hmm. And it goes, it goes through the scale, the flanging scale, whatever it is. I wouldn't say scale, but just the <laughs> flanging progression. Mm -hmm. And what I did <coughs> was looked at it at one point and took that from my bass line. Then it got to another point in the track and looked at it and put that as my mid-range. Then it got to the top bit. I, do you know what? It'd be great to actually break that down maybe in a future video. Mm -hmm. You know, break it down and get the virus down and, and show you how that... Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah, how, we could well do a wee collab that, video or something. Know, like how, honestly, that would be and how, insane. And how, how, how I got the bass line and the mid-range and, and, and the top, because there wasn't that much involved in the track. You know, I just, the, the bottom end, though, the kick when it dropped in and then that such a unique sound there was nothing like it around no, there, still, there still hasn't been yeah. I've not heard a track like it there's yeah. not been a track like oh that sounds like Monitor Monitor was its own no beast way. I want to hear this man aye I mean it's a something, killer something track something play loud like aye. big system it was, it, was, it was on spinning when spinning was good Oxygen was it? Oxygen that's, that's right. it I remember the label yeah, yeah, yeah. It, was on, it was on spinning because when they were doing proper kind of cutting edge cooler mm. stuff cool stuff what they're doing now is great you know it appeals to the masses mm -hmm. you know that's great you know but back then they were really cutting edge oh, as you said it was incredible yeah it was mm. incredible oh, I so yeah this. I mean the, the Sebroff stuff I'm, I'm still dipping my toe in doing it here and there you know I'm doing some stuff for other guys that probably kind of on, on an engineering tip that's mm -hmm. just you know it keeps my my eye and I'm doing mm -hmm. some stuff with Mark Sherry with the Thickest Street stuff that's you know right. so I wouldn't say it's out and out, it's kind of bordering, yeah. it, isn't it? You know, it's just... But, I mean, I still enjoy writing techno. Mm -hmm. I still enjoy it. I mean, I've got... Over the last kind of month or so, I've got three or four sitting there that mm -hmm. are finished, ready mm -hmm. to go. Cool. So there is, you I'd know... I'd love to hear them. Aye, I'll, I'll let you hear them, Stevie. Aye. aye. I'll, 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 we'll, we'll have a wee listening session aye. before Definitely. I go up the road. Aye, aye. aye. sounds good. Aye. Oh, that sounds amazing. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant, Stevie. Aye. Oh, Stevie, that's amazing. I know. Aye, you bounce back. Oh, <laughs> let, me, let me show you mine. Let me show you mine. <laughs> But this is great, this is great. Right, so, Chris Kyle, what was uh -huh. this? Uh, so again, Chris Kyle, Chris Kyle's a BMX dude, doesn't yes, he? Yes, right, one in okay. top ten in the right, world. Okay, so, um, 
Instagram. Now you like look on Instagram, you know, and, and, and you post daily and you get used to things and mm-hmm. you maybe just Chris was the, the first guy that I kinda I don't even know how I stumbled across him. He calls it a jib. I don't even know what a jib is, but I know the word. Mm-hmm. And he'll probably be able to tell you, I think a jib's a move or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Right. I'm not down with the kids with the BMX right. and stuff and all that, you know, but right. every morning, Chris Kyle, boom, he posts a wee jib. Mm-hmm. And every morning, I would look for that. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it got me thinking, it got me into a mindset of looking for his jib on social media, on Instagram every day. I'm thinking, you know, that's how you, that's how you, use the, social the media platform. Aye, that's how you use the platform so if you do something regular every single day people expect that every single day and that's why you end up yeah you know people start kind of I don't know transcending towards you you know I've got to look for that and, and and that made me do things I'd post I started posting things at the same mm-hmm. point you know nine and one people are going to their work yeah. you know this was before I'd even figured out what's the best times to post you know, and it was just, it's just a crap kind of wee story when I heard his name there that yeah, every yeah. morning I'd wake up in the morning and I'd look, I'd look forward to seeing what he was Chris doing. Kyle's wee jib. <laughs> Even though I wasn't into um, BMX or anything like that, Aye. I was just inspired uh, Inspired by his ability to do what he does on a BMX. And that's you know? that, the quality of the videos and, and um, the stuff he's doing. It's Unreal. no wonder you're looking forward to it. Yeah. It's incredible. He's such a talent. Him and Danny. McCaskill Danny's and another level two, again. Two yeah, I mean, I mean, Danny as well as um, Dunk, and I'm sure you, have you met Dunk. It I does the know. drop and roll stuff with Danny. It's his right hand man. You've got Ali. You know, right. They all stay in the set. It's funny. Danny's, he's a crazy man. He'll just go. He, you know, he, I'll do it. Mm-hmm. But it's precise and it's controlled when he does it. Dunks, he's more the muscle for me. You know. Mm-hmm. It's funny how you, you look at these guys and they've got their enemy attributes and Ali's just smooth. Mm-hmm. Just seamless wee mm-hmm. tricks and it just... <laughs> and it's just it's waltzing ball, about, ball, you know, yeah. and, and Dunk's just oh, bang, bang, bang and, and Danny's just... He's just a man. I yeah. mean, he... I mean, I watched one there recently around at my mates and I think it was in Sky or something and he's up this... Oh, the ridge? The, the ridge. Yeah, the BBC this, thing. This rock, mate, that's so dangerous... How he's even got up there, he's had to carry his bike the whole way up, yeah. and then he comes down the most insane. Like, I mean, one wee mistake, oh, he's, he's gone, man, gone. and he's right you, down the thing. I mean, do, he's insane. such a down to earth guy, Danny, Dunk, Ali, all the guys, you know, they just live for what they do, you know. And, and you and need to, don't you? Money and fame and whatever else it comes with being so good at what you do is hasn't phased them for me personally just meeting them in any way whatsoever mm-hmm. you know and all the guys they're all kind of cut off the same cloth you know they're all kind of yeah it's important man it it's is money like, and fame's funny money and fame comes after you you know you nail a craft essentially there yeah, music, I think so. you know and if you're putting out just great content you just focus on the craft rather than focusing on the expectation or what it money, looks like as whatever. well that's it that's you need to do your 10,000 hours, don't you? Aye. You know, it's all about you putting do. in the hours, you know. I, I mean, it, back in the early 2000s, we did the public domain stuff. I had the questions track out. Mm-hmm. You know, I had, again, still this wee guy for Sight Hall. I had more mm-hmm. money in my bank than my dad did. Mm-hmm. I could have went out and played golf with the boys. Mm-hmm. Six pack, summer. Mm-hmm. But I didn't. Mm-hmm. You know, I was in the studio. And I could have. I could have took two years off. Mm-hmm. Not being big-headed or anything like that, yeah, but right. a lot of money kicking about in the early 2000s, you know, insane amounts of money, you know, but it made me work harder. Mm-hmm. So it did, you know, and I think, again, it's all about focus and being driven. So wow, man. Yep. And on that point... I know, we could probably go for another know, hour, man. I know. Well, that was amazing. It's been long overdue. That's why we could keep talking about it for ages, but... I'm just like an old sweetie wife here, I mean, I'm sorry if I digress a lot no, of the time, you know. It's, it's great. Just... It's exactly what I expected in, in the rest and, and more, you know, so it's, it's, it's good, man. It's been a, it's been a pleasure. Aye. Thanks for having us, guys. Made our job easy. Total, total pleasure. I know, just 
It was amazing not was to see to just delve in like that and hear the history. I mean, a lot of people need to know as well, you know, guys like yourself have literally paved the way for Scottish dance music, you know? I mean, I think, I'd I'd like to think, you know, I'm just one me kind of tiny part, small, small part of the jigsaw. Well, you definitely are. You know, and, and, you know, and I think, yeah, again, what I said earlier, I think success is actually getting up in the morning and going doing... I mean, I'd rather get paid less doing something I love than mm-hmm. getting paid more and hate my life. Mm-hmm. And what a way to wrap this up, man. <laughs> <laughs> a brick's a brick. A brick is a, a brick. Is a brick. <laughs> That's my brother. My brother, man. Oh, <laughs> get the, the Davey, it's been thing. top class, honestly. I appreciate it, oh, mate. We'll go up and get a wee listen now. Aye, let's get a wee listening let's session. Let's do that. And let's get this... Uh, Reconstruction of this monitor Aye, track that, on the go, to man. To be continued on that. Aye, front, I, I think that'd be, I think that'd be, that'd be cool mm-hmm. as you know, just kind of break it down and, and just show you exactly where I got that. Mm-hmm. Again, it's all from one loop. Wow, it's, yeah. it's, that's creativity for you. It's though, mind blowing. Man. You know, it's just from one loop. It's no even. Right, I'll get that for there. I'll get that for there. I heard that and I heard. Mm-hmm. You know, and just oh, <laughs> ah, ah, you know, like, I, I just you know, and just and it all kind of, all kind of fell into place. Amazing. It's amazing, aye. It's a killer track. Well, it sounds like we'll do that as well then. Can't so. wait to hear it, man. Yeah. Okay, so episode 21. 21, man. David Forbes. Amazing. Amazing. Great chats. Thanks, guys. Cheers, Cheers man. See you yeah, soon. Yeah, until next time. Cheers, guys. That's it.